Marshy International University, Fairfield, Iowa. I'm Dr. Guthrie. I'm Professor and Dean Emeritus in the Computer Science Department in the Department and College of Mathematics and Computer Science at Marshy International University, Fairfield, Iowa. Our Department in Computer Science, we offer undergraduate and graduate degrees. This presentation is information is about the master's degree in computer science in what we call the COMPRO or Computer Science Professionals Program. Computer Science Professionals means that we have the traditional academic degree, the master's graduate degree in computer science, plus professional application and training in using that through a full-time placement position at an IT company in the U.S. This provides a really a unique program, unique in multiple ways. The first is that we really emphasize the most current technical content. And current technical content means that in addition to whatever textbooks or materials one might have, which were written two or three years before and then about things that happened before that, that's not current things that are going on in the industry right then, the tools, the techniques, the procedures, the standards. So we have faculty that go out and do consulting, work with these companies and bring back that knowledge and integrate it into the academic classroom experience. The second thing is a unique approach to creativity and intelligence. And creativity and intelligence means it means your intelligence. It means your ability to know and learn. If you attempt to learn more and more and more and more information, but you don't increase the capability, your ability to understand and apply that, then that gap is just stress. So we need to elevate the student's intelligence, the student's intelligence and creativity at the same time we raise the level and amount of information that we deliver to them. And the third thing is this idea of integration with professional practice, professional activities, professional knowledge. And we do that by modifying the academic program so it's not just classroom study, but involves full-time work on site at a large IT company in the U.S. These are new things. I say it's unique, and if it's unique, it should have unique results. And the results are the advanced MS degree that you have at the end of the program, this integration with professional experience, and the third thing is fully paid practicum. Now, practicum is not summer work or student internship or some part-time thing to taste what it's like to work. Most of the people coming into our program already have significant professional accomplishments and experience, and this is to raise them up to a new level. That's why this title says, maximize your career and profession. And it adds, and your life. And that's because, as I'll say in a minute, education should not just be about profession. It should be about you and your life and all of your accomplishments. So the agenda will be something about our university, Maharshi University, an overview, because we're a smaller university. The CS technical job market, since we integrate with that. This aspect of creativity and education being integrated as well, we call that consciousness-based education, which I'll come back to that definition in a moment. And then some details and specifics about our curriculum, our courses, our scheduling, and the finances of the program. Starting off with our university, Maharshi International University, it was founded by Maharshi Mahesh Yogi in 1973 in the U.S., and it was to add the idea of consciousness, consciousness, knowledge, intelligence, receptivity, awareness of the student to education. Now, it sounds like this must be obvious because education is not about teaching. It's not about a broadcast mode. It's about what's learned. It's about what you can understand. Otherwise, there's knowledge everywhere. There's libraries, online courses, and so on. But most universities don't have a way, they don't have a proven scientific logical way to, to increase your ability to know, not just what they're delivering to you, but your ability to know. Consciousness in this context means the inner intelligence of the student. Consciousness we can think of as the idea that, well, I guess we all know what unconscious means. It means we don't know anything. <laughs> We're out. And Fully conscious would be in every discipline, in every culture. There's knowledge of very aware, very enlightened people in the historical record. So somewhere in between that, we are all. And if each one of us even has a range of consciousness of awareness. Maybe we're dull or tired sometimes. Other times we're more alert and awake. 
So how do we raise ourselves up that spectrum? How do we turn that parameter, that dial, and increase our consciousness so we can learn more at the same time? That's what we have at our university. And it came from Maharshi teaching this technique of, of it was a meditation technique taught around the world. It was well known that meditation made people more alert, more balanced, more aware, but it hadn't been integrated into education yet. And that's what we did. So he founded a university to do that. We're a strong and well-established university known for our research and this innovation approach to education that we have. We received over 26 to $28 million in research grants from the government and research institutions and foundations, indicating respect and honor for the academic excellence of the faculty in the university. We do have a strong faculty worldwide, many with PhDs and strong academic experience and a global reputation. One way to think of the goal of education would be that, that we're always seeking more. We always want to know what's beyond what we have now. If we have any scope of job or finance or positions, family, and it, we always want more. We want to be more, to have more, to give more, to enrich those around us. And even in science, in science, this diagram shows, this, this old lithograph shows that even if we knew all about the heavens and the earth and the sciences, physics, botany, biology, all that, we still want to know more. So this depicts someone who's looking out to the heavens, saying, well, how does the universe work? How does everything work? How do I work? Not just science on the outside, engineering, technology, but how do I work? So bringing that into education is important, and that's part of the mission and goal and accomplishment of our university. We can see that in society even because in different areas of development through the ages, Stone Age was very crude, a very rough level of life, not much knowledge, moving into Iron Age, knowing about how to utilize materials and resources in the earth, building those, giving structure to them and dynamics in terms of machines, moving those machines to be electronic, electronic level, utilizing invisible waves, electromagnetic waves channeled through materials of copper and, and metallic structures like that and then connecting those up to a global computer system, a global intelligence system. So intelligence is really the key to this age. We're not an iron age anymore, a factory age. We're an age of intelligence, a computer age. And where is it? Where does this intelligence come from? It comes from us. It's our consciousness, our understanding, our knowledge of life. And each of these shows a changing paradigm. And a paradigm means a worldview. It means our model and understanding of the world. Previous paradigms were what we could call objective science. Objective means out there, things, physics. Physics means physical, things that we can see and measure and weigh. And that model is very, it is objective, and that means that we consider subjectivity be, to be beyond consideration in that because humans were so complex, so ununderstandable in that age. And in that, what we did was we made simplifying assumptions that these non-systematic, non-organized living beings, the intelligence is fixed. And we know that idea of IQ, an intelligence quotient. It doesn't matter how much you know. You can't study for it or read a book to get some. You can take it in high school and college. It's your ability to know is what it alleges to measure. And the idea is it's fixed. You're, you're 100 or you're 120. You're smart or, <laughs> or good luck. So it's, like, it's like recruiting for a basketball team. You're tall, good. You're not uh, short, maybe you go on some other team, something like that. So universities and colleges, they screen for enrollment. They have all these entrance exams and backgrounds. And then the idea is to put as much information in as possible. This is an old view. And we have a new view that's now developing in the world. And that is that subject to develop us, how we work, not just how things work, but how we work should also be scientific. And we should be able to apply systematic methods to it. We could consider this as a technology where we can think of it as optimizing ourselves, and that really means optimizing our brain as a central part of that. And if we can do that, if we can find a technique, and, and that's what we have and what I'll describe, then we can increase intelligence. You're not fixed. You're not, oh, you're 100 and good luck. No, you can be 110, 120, 130. And in fact, I'll show some, some brief research showing where exactly that's been demonstrated at universities in previous studies. And that means we can enliven the creative genius in everyone, not just locate it, but enliven it in everyone. 
This leads to the idea of a new educational system, and that's what we've been modeling and creating over the last 40, 45 years. And we've a lot of published research, over 600 different published and reviewed studies by the faculty, thousands of graduates and alumni. And this new system of education, if it's a new approach, it should have new results, and it does. And those are quantifiable, they're measured, it's a scientific result. This isn't some claim. All universities say, oh, live a better life, be a better person. Where's the science? Where's the measurements? Where's the proof that it really works? So we have that. And where is the goal of education? Well, the goal of education is more knowledge, not just more knowledge, but why for more success? Why for more happiness in life? Again, we want to be more, to have more, to give more to ourselves, to those around us, to our family, to our culture, to our country, to the world. This is the goal that everyone has in life, to have a better life and to share it. So not just academic book learning, which has been denigrated over periods of time. Okay, And full development, therefore, would mean what? It would mean, yes, knowledge of our discipline of computer science, the core knowledge, current activities and applications, but also so-called soft skills. And soft skills means, it means us. It means creativity, balance, intelligence, health, communication, all of these things. And these are now recognized as very important in all areas of life, personal life as well as professional. Sometimes it's talked about as being emotional intelligence, not just IQ, but EQ, our personality, who we are and what we do. And this is then an essential part of all full development, okay? So from that, the next thing I'll talk about briefly is the CS technical job market, because as I said, we integrate that with our academics. And technology is the future. Technology is the present and it's the future as well. And software development is the base of that. We have software in our, our watches, in our cars, in our airplanes, in our TVs, our refrigerators, our space probes. Our technology is everywhere. And it's always more, it's always more, it's always more. It's not something that we've done and we're done with. It's always growing, it's always going to be more. And that's a good thing for us because that's our industry and that's what we enjoy doing is this sort of progress. And in the U.S., Technology jobs are thriving. There's about 7.3 million technology jobs. This is not just software, but all technology jobs. And it's been expanding about 2% per quarter since 2016, and it continues on that. And the reports over past years were that these were the best jobs. That means not just money or environment or challenge or promotion or security, but the most enjoyable jobs for people to have because it's, it's a very creative industry. And when we look at the market, the U.S. government projection was that we have a half a million new technology jobs over this five-year period leading up to 2024. Half a million new jobs. That's a lot. And why? Because there's more than 10 times as many computing jobs open now than there were graduates. So that means that this is an important area for us as a nation, as a country, as a world, to try and find competent people to grow into and contribute to. So this graph shows something interesting. It shows that the supply of computer science graduates is undergraduates as well as graduates is small, about 60,000. And yet the number of opening jobs when these data came out a couple years ago, it takes a little while for the government to collect and publish the data, was almost 10 times that. So what happens when there's a big gap between supply and demand? Price changes, and price means the market for us, the market for advanced knowledge in this discipline. But if you've already working and have a computer science background and degree and job, why get more? And the answer is there's lots of good answers. One of them is that you have more opportunities, more possibilities for choice and direction and promotion, but also even financially. It's been shown in surveys that people with higher degrees, even a master's degree in computer science or own, are able to get salaries that are higher up to $20,000 a year more. So if you think about it, even if a degree costs $40,000, it would be a nominal number I'll give later, that even in two years you can pay back the whole cost, and over the next 20 years, salaries go up and up and up and up. So it's a very good thing. And what does it say? It says the best place to invent, invest money is not gold or silver, but it's in yourself, in your future. And to do that, 
What are the most important qualities that employers are looking for? And here, a recent survey said that the hardest skills to find were so-called soft skills, those personal qualities that I mentioned earlier. Almost a third of the companies reported that as the hardest to find. Hard skills, degrees, background, transcripts, courses, also important, of course, you wouldn't be able to get your resume in the stack without that, but significantly less, only about two thirds as much. So how to be successful in this fast growing market, strong academic background, advanced degree means a better job, better salary, better future and promotion, and increased personal qualities. Quality is creativity, balance, intelligence, all of these things. These are things that aren't available at other universities. They don't have a systematic way to do that, and we do. And I'll talk a little bit about that next. I'll talk about creativity in education, what we call consciousness-based education. So the idea is consciousness. Consciousness means alertness, creativity, ability to learn, not just what to learn, but ability to learn. And as I said before, this is really the missing element of education. And that's what's unique that we want to provide here at our university. Well, how does this relate to computer science? Well, we know software is really a complex thing. There's so many aspects involved in it. And one phrase that I like, it says, first, solve the problem. So solution, coming up with an understanding, a global understanding, and then write the code. And code is so many details to write. And programming is something that now, at least in the U.S., it's popular to say, oh, you can become a programmer, you can learn programming in six weeks, three months, six months. Be a programmer, it's a big industry. But programming is not the same as computer science. In lower schools, even in 12, 13, 14-year-olds in 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th grade, they're learning programming now. Python and Ruby and JavaScript and these things. So if programming isn't the hard part, semicolons, brackets, syntax, very simple things, of course. But if children are learning it, what is hard? And what's hard is there's so many things involved in actually writing and creating a software system. Analysis, design, understanding the application domain, mapping that onto a model. It could be a reactive model, an object-oriented model, a functional model, a state program, so many different ways, mapping those into algorithms and data structures and the right combination of them for time or space optimization or complexity. And then mapping that into a programming language, the languages, the tools, the IDEs, the frameworks, so many different things to learn. And not only that, you don't work in isolation, you have to work in a business, so how to communicate and get along with others. Even this, such a long list, not a whole list. There's performance, security, deployment, DevOps, CI, testing. Many, many things are involved with it. And it's not enough to be good at any one or two. You have to be able to have all of these things together to really be good. A term sometimes used for that is software architect. Architect, to build the wholeness of something that fits together in a cohesive, coherent fashion. Well, we've gotten pretty good at this. We've gotten pretty good at this for building computers and software and robots. And we now have robots that roam around on other planets, the Mars rover and so on. And we've been improving every year. Moore's Law says that hardware, at least, performance doubles every year. And our, our software rides on top of that. Our software gets faster and more complex, more capable as well. But we're nearing the top of that curve. We're now at the limits of physics, where our junctions and our gates are at the size of atomic and molecular limits. Thermal noise, thermal atomic noise, we can't get any smaller. Although quantum mechanics will perhaps break that barrier. But we're so good at it. So objective technology is like this. What about subjective technology, us? Because we're the ones who have to embed our intelligence into it. We're not so good at that. And why? Because humans are complex. We are complex. We're still trying to figure out how we work. The, the brain project in Europe tries to model a few neurons, neural networks, a small, tiny portion of the brain. And not only that, we don't really yet know how we work. We're trying to figure that out. So machines, things on the outside, very good. Mathematics, physics, quantitative engineering. Subjective, not so much. And in fact, if we look at the current state of the art, it says that early development from zero, age zero to 20, what happens is 
that the brain develops and neurons are growing and many, many connections are being formed as we learn. And, and then at mid-20s, it peaks out and the brain is pruned down to what it can maintain energy-wise and physiology-wise. So they say that intellectual maturity of the physical side, you know, mid-20s, late-20s is when... But then what happens? <laughs> Downward from there. We all know that kind of idea, that model, that that oh, old age, everything breaks and memory's gone and all of this. Not a very good picture. So that's not a very good model. It certainly isn't Moore's Law, which says everything's going up. So we have to somehow get off of this curve and onto that curve. A term that's been used is to unfreeze brain development. It was growing until this point. How can we keep it growing? Do that, what we need is we need some more science and some more technology that applies to us and not just applies to things on the outside. And the brain is like our CPU. It defines all activity, everything that we do. The brain defines and controls everything. And at the same time, it learns by what we do. So there's a feedback loop here. It, what we do is determined by our CPU, our brain, and what the brain is determined is by what we do. Everything we do, everything we learn is by some structural system in our brain, this neural network, which is, of course, we try to model that in software and now, in fact, in some hardware chips. So we have this feedback loop, self-adopting brain structure. If you want to learn to play the piano, you don't read a book and, oh, now you can do it. No, you have to do it and do it and do it. And finally, after a while, you rewire your brain. You rewire your brain so that then you can just do it automatically. And that's in fact what happens when we learn anything. People that learn sports, that area of their brain is much more richly connected. People that learn a musical instrument, their fingers and their hearing and the integration of the two and their creativity, that area of their brain is different than anyone else around. Everyone has a unique and different brain. And you have a different brain today than you had yesterday, than you'll have tomorrow. Every day your brain is adapting to what you do, both by diet and food and sleep and rest and patterns, and what you do with it. So it's a feedback loop. It's a recursive mind-body connection. And we all know recursion, a loop that loops on itself, okay? So one approach to try and increase this capability is to say, consider the brain as a machine and just try it like a database to keep putting more and more information in. Take a course, read a book, take a Udemy course, something like that. But this is really very overly simplistic because the brain is a million or more, much more complex than any system that we have. They say the brain has a hundred billion neurons, a hundred billion neurons, and each one has about a thousand connections. So that means a hundred trillion connect elements, 100 trillion programmable elements in your brain. This is more than all of the computers in the world, probably. And it's more sophisticated. And why is it more sophisticated? Two elements, its structure and its dynamic self-programming capability. The brain is highly structured and different areas of capability are located or centralized in different areas of the brain. And we all probably know that idea of right brain and left brain. Creativity and the artist, so to speak, is in the right brain and the other is in the so-called left brain. In the front an area not shown here, the frontal cortex, which integrates the two together. But this is really way, way too simplistic. That, in fact, the brain is much more complex and diversified. And that means that everything is centralized and requires coordination. Language isn't just located in one area, but its meaning is over here, language is over here, the physical part of, of hearing receptors are here. It's all over and everything has to be coordinated. The brain is a complex interconnected system. And we have to be able to somehow support that and nurture it and grow, grow our brain in that way. How do you grow a brain? You do something that gives that experience and the brain adapts to it. Okay, that's the key. So that's the key element of this education, that the brain is self-adjusting, dynamic and self-adjusting. It adapts to optimize for activity. And this is called neural plasticity. Neural plasticity means that it's, pl it's adjusting and it optimizes itself. So this isn't a theory or a philosophy. This is science. And how do we apply that science to get a result, sort of like the technology that goes with the science. And we talk about this in terms of brain optimization, okay? Like 
optimizing our CPU. Fix the CPU, everything is faster. Increase our brain, everything's better. Health is better, personality is better, feelings better, happiness is better. So we want to optimize our brain. Now the next couple of slides aren't about computer science, unless you're a computer scientist and that's what you do. So this is about whatever you do, a better brain, you do it better. Well, stress and fatigue we know are bad. When we're dull or tired, we know that we don't do anything well. We don't feel well. We don't act well. How do you solve this problem? Oh, don't even ask me. I'm too tired. Ask me tomorrow. So the brain loses capability and it loses clarity. What's the solution? Get some rest. Rest resolves this and the brain gains clarity automatically. And I want to emphasize that. We don't study a book, How to Sleep. Low end, because when you sleep so many, everything, everything changes. The blood pressure changes, the blood chemistry changes, the brain waves change, heart rate changes, breathing changes, everything changes. We don't, we don't know it, we haven't learned it. The body automatically optimizes given that rest, and that's a key thing. And this then provides increased health, creativity, and intelligence. So how do we optimize the brain? In our educational system, we use what's called transcendental meditation. It's kind of an unusual name, perhaps. Meditation means thinking. Transcendental means stop thinking. <laughs> Go beyond it. Quit thinking. Well, all day long we're thinking, we're studying, we're analyzing. Stop that and go beyond it. It gives a deeper level of rest than sleep. The body gets a very refined level of quality sleep. And the mind then also gets that same silence and balance. And like sleep, it's automatic and simple. It's not, we don't think about it or believe in it or hope for it or wish... It doesn't matter. We just do it, and its results are automatically. And the results are automatic, too. There's more mental clarity, and this is all documented by lots and lots of research. It's simple and university. So this is our educational technology, transcendental meditation. The body is silent and settled, and the mind also is more coherent and more balanced. It's simple. It's easy. It's universal. It's not a philosophy or study. It's a simple practice. And over the last 60 to 70 years, Millions and millions of people have done it, and lots and lots of science on the results. And all we've done is integrate that in with education, because that's exactly the result we want in our students and for our students as they go out. One or two more quick slides showing just the logic of how this works, since we are a science program, and it's good to understand science behind it. And this is in terms of brain wave coherence. Brain wave coherence means measuring what's going on in the brain and how interconnected it is. Remember that idea that nothing's located in one place and so many things have to coordinate for architecture and to have it work. And what this just shows is that red means more coherence areas of the brain functioning together in a synchronous manner. Coherence is a mathematical analysis of that. And even if we just close our eyes, we know that closing our eyes, we feel differently because we're cutting off the external inputs. We're more on ourself. And when we do that, then more and more of the brain and the back is coherent. And the frontal areas, which is thinking and action, not so much. And when students begin or anyone begins to practice this TM technique, it's a deeper level of silence and rest. And look what happens. More and more of the brain is integrated, is coherent. It's working synchronously with itself and within itself. And that's a rather kind of technical thing, measuring electrical activity of the brain and how integrated it is. But what does it mean? Well, it means that this EEG coherence is really correlated with everything good that the brain does. And one of the things we'll focus on or just comment on is IQ, because I mentioned earlier, IQ is thought to be fixed. You're smart or you're not. Good luck. And at a large study at a U.S. Uh, in University in Washington, D.C., a longitudinal study over four years, what was shown that in the control group, students picked randomly and assigned to one of the two groups, IQ, which started at 116 average, it actually went down. Going to college and your IQ goes down, well, students don't keep a good schedule oftentimes, maybe not a good diet, and they eat and drink and consume and party and do things that maybe aren't so good for them. And the TM group, what happened? IQ went up. Now this IQ, thought to be fixed, went up, went up by over 10%. That means that the way their brain is functioning is clearer, it's better. And whether they're a physicist, a mathematician, a computer scientist, business, they're better at it, at everything they do. So that's, it's a very amazing and startling and valuable result. So this is a new 
experience that we give the system, the brain, and then the brain adapts to it, and there you are, there's our feedback loop. First, it's during the TM practice, but then as we know, neuroplasticity, the brain adapts to it until all the time during the day it's better. So obviously it's a really great thing for us and for students to have as an educational program. But not just education, businesses are also quite alert to the importance and value of this. And what they find is that when we've been to Microsoft talking to their hiring managers, they say that over 50% of their hiring is based on these so-called soft qualities and who you are and what you do. So that's a big factor. And we call this at MUM, we call it consciousness-based education. We could call it student-centered education because it's centered around the intelligence of the student. And all students in our classes, we practice TM twice a day in the morning to be fresh and alert when we go to class to learn. And then after class and after the labs and all this focus to practice and begin to become more balanced and settled. Uh, and the basic principle is so simple. It's that mind and body are intimately connected. I think all of us would sort of intuitively and experientially know that already. And this isn't, I'll emphasize again, it's not a philosophy or a motto or a goal or a mission. It's, it's something we can measure. Brain activity can be measured to show it. The results are concrete and they're measurable. So that's the technique we have for that unique part of growing the intelligence of students while we're providing them with the content of the discipline. And our discipline, of course, is computer science. So next I'll talk a little bit about our computer science compro program the format and how it works in the classes and curriculum. Let's go over the review, go over and review the details of the actual academic program and its content. Well, first of all, almost all of this information is easily available online at our Compro website, and you can look up anything that you might miss or may not understand. And also, as we'll point out at the end, we have a very strong admissions team who is always online and available to help you. You can always just email or call us. This program has gotten very popular, and although we're a fairly small university, we probably have 1,500 or so full-time equivalent undergrad and graduate enrollments, this program has grown to be one of the five largest in the U.S., largest MSCS programs. How can that be? How can such a small university, a small private university, grow to have one of the lar largest and most successful programs in MSCS in the United States? And the answer is just because it's such a unique combination of features, as I've gone over before. So we have students mostly coming from other countries, and you'll see why, in fact, this has such great international appeal. Well, the program structure, as I said, is a unique combination of these three things, this development of creativity and intelligence, this advanced graduate study and the master's degree, and then professional work experience. And how do we do that? We combine three things. We combine on-campus study, the working practicum, and distance education. Okay? And this combination of work and study is not an academic impact as much as it's a practical impact. It makes for very easy entry finances. We'll show what that means. And also long-term earnings over the program as well as after. So the program begins with full-time on-campus studies. And so that means that for about eight months, students study in a traditional on-campus with their faculty and in laboratories for their labs, so on. And then you complete your coursework through online distance education while you're working full-time in an advanced IT position. And again, this is not a student internship or a summer job. It's a full developer placement at one of these companies. It's the same curriculum as on campus, and in fact, we record it in our campus classes. And then DE faculty use video lectures, text, and internet to provide support for that. So here's what the structure looks like. Well, you're probably most familiar with a typical semester system. Typically 10 courses for a graduate curriculum in the U.S., 30, 33 units, three units per course. Take five courses one semester, five the next. The end of every semester is all of the exams, projects, very stressful time. Everything has to be finished in that one week. First thing we do is we flip that on its side. We use what's called the block system. Only two or three other universities do this. You study one course at a time. It makes it very modular. Of course, software, we know about modularity and the benefits, and we'll see another one in a moment. You study one course at a time. So in one month, you study full-time with that faculty and all the students in your group. So group projects, group focus, morning and afternoon, all week, 
five and a half days a week, three and a half weeks. This is much more like a real professional setup. You don't go to IBM and say, I'll work for an hour on Monday, then maybe an hour and maybe an hour. No, no, that part-time. And also for you, at the end of every course, you're able to focus on just that one course. So you, all of your exams and projects and student pro and presentations, everything, and then you move on to the next course. This also allows for longer sequences of courses to develop more advanced knowledge. Studying perhaps introductory, intermediate, and advanced things. Three courses in a row, whereas with a semester system, not possible without extending for a whole nother semester. Well, now we have this standard block system, which would be one year for the 10 courses. And we do, in fact, offer that, but that's not the co-op program, not the Compro program. So what we do is for Compro, we split this into two parts. We have approximately the first six courses on campus, and then the last four in distance education. You're not on campus anymore. You're out in some city working in the U.S. And the name for that is CPT, Curricular Practical Training. That's a technical visa term in the U.S., meaning you don't need a separate visa. All of this work is part of your academic program, supervised by and with the university and the faculty. So now you start with this six months, eight, six courses, eight months on campus. And that means eight courses, eight months, because you might start, might be some vacation, some additional course at the beginning, something like that. Then you go out and you get a job. And you get a job. We don't hire you. We don't, because different students want to work in different places, different locations, different businesses, different areas, some in web, some in development, some in system programming, some in UI, different, all kinds of different things. So you interview with, you choose the companies you want to work with. And then you go and you work in that. So this CPT, this is the full-time job placement. You're working there in some company, but you haven't finished your academics, so you finish that through this distance education. Four courses left. Each full-time one-month course takes four months part-time in the DE, so four courses, that's about 16 months. That means that the overall program is not a one-year program anymore. It's a 24 to 30-month program to complete the degree. And at the end, then, what do you have? You have completed your academics, you have your graduate degree, you have two, two and a half years of professional work experience at a U.S. company, and you have all of the finances and income from that, and you have this growth of intelligence and knowledge from your program. It's a wonderful program, and it's a wonderful putting together of all these elements. And there's only one, one catch, one problem, and that's money. Isn't that always a problem? Money, the financial challenge. The idea is that graduate education in the U.S. is very expensive. So a typical degree at a regular university, another university, might be forty, sixty, eighty thousand dollars for a professional or MBA or uh, engineering degree. Uh, our university, we have the block system, but still you have to pay tuition. So we we charge a little less because we're a smaller university, but still you would have to pay at the beginning and finish your degree. So here you pay. You have to come up with sixty, eighty thousand dollars, and then at the end, try and get a job and work and pay off that loan. So what do we do? What's the solution? Well, really, one way of looking at it, there's not a problem. In the big picture, we know that you're going to make a lot of money because demand is so high for technical computing degrees. Salaries are very high, and hiring is very quick. So you're going to have plenty of ability to pay off these educational fees, but. You just don't have it at the beginning. So, of course, in computer science, we call this a bootstrapping problem. You have what you need later, but you need it now to get started. So well, what's the solution? The solution is us. <laughs> we bootstrap you. We provide financing for you to take this program and make it possible. And how does that work? Well, first of all, we have a very low initial payment. So instead of forty, sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000, it's five to $7,000 typically, and even lower in some countries depending on the financial structure of that country. Could be up to $3,000 reduction. And then you take these courses on campus, and then you go out again, and you, when you start your job practicum, we have an arrangement with a local bank. And that bank, normally you wouldn't be able to get a student loan. U.S. students get federal and government and bank loans because they're U.S. International students can't get any of that. But we have this special arrangement with this financial institution that because you're working with us and through us, they will give you that financing. And that then pays off the rest of your fees because you've paid a small amount here. And our program costs, let's estimate it, $40,000. It could be a little more, a little bit less. 
And if you've paid, let's estimate, average 5000 at the beginning, you, there's still $35,000 somewhere that has to pay for your classes and your dorms and your food and everything in your labs. So when you start your job, you're going to have this, you're going to be working full time. And average starting salaries are between eighty dollars and $90,000. They range from eighty, ninety, a hundred thousand dollars $100,000, but let's take an average number of $90,000. So while you're finishing your courses in DE, you work and then you take that money and that high salary, you're able to pay back and pay back your program educational loan costs to the bank. Okay? And let's just run a couple of quick numbers that let's say you make, uh, let's even take a low number. You get a job making $82,000. So you work for two and a half, two, two and a half years, let's say two years, two times 82,000, 164,000. This is pre-tax, pre-living, just gross income, and you owed thirty-five thousand, so one hundred eighty thousand, one hundred eighty-four thousand minus thirty-five. Let's make it thirty-four. Is one hundred and fifty thousand dollars that you have for your support and living and wherever you live and your car and your food and your housing and your boat and your airplane, whatever, whatever it is that you do. Okay. So what's the result? The result is that you complete your MS degree after this period of time, you have substantial U.S. work experience and the ability to pay off all or most of your program fees and still have some savings, depending on how you like to manage your money. So that's it. If you understand this structure, this is the algorithm. This is what the program structure looks like. And online on our website, we have calculators that can help you go through the details of what your finances would look like. Well. This is a MSCS program. You must recognize the names of most of the courses that we would have. And those courses then map into the graduate curriculum and other uh, both electives and specializations. Our specializations include software development and big data and web enterprise programming. Those are two of the tracks that we have that mostly focus on. Our faculty, our top level faculty from PhD universities in the US and around the world, most of them, and uh, some master's programs with substantial work experience, and faculty might go out and work again at E-Trade and Google and Apple and so on for four, five, six years and come back to tell us and teach the students what's really going on at these companies right now in the world, okay? Students work throughout the U.S. As I said, you choose where you want to work. You enter with the companies. We have a very strong placement office, and they teach you how to do. We do professional resume service. We have a three-week seminar on it. You have a month or two on campus under their support to find a job. And over a 1,000 companies have hired our jobs. Some students want to work at some famous big place. Oh, I want to go to the U.S. and work at Disneyland or Google or Apple. It, there's many, many other companies in all sizes and locations. Big company, you see a little part of a large product line. Small company, you see the full range of development. So lots of things, lots of choices, lots of opportunities. So in conclusion, we have a unique program. <coughs> and the unique program means that we have the block system, the academic degree plus professional experience, easy entry finances, self-financing through the CPT placement and this growth of creativity and intelligence. And if it's a unique, it should have unique results. And yes, knowledge and experience, both of them, and self-growth plus finances. As I mentioned, the program's become very popular. We have about 400 students in every entry, four entries per year. Uh, Elaine Guthrie, my wife, will give another video that you can follow this with, talking about admissions and processes and finances. Uh, Elaine's here in the front with a group that she had just brought in, and behind it is our student union building with where dining and some classrooms are. Another large entry of 100. We have a beautiful, nice campus out in the country. It's a safe, peaceful, beautiful campus, and many students actually they, they say they feel like this is their home now, their home in the U.S. Uh, this is another view of the dining hall and the main campus building, and on the left here is one of the computer science classroom buildings, and another one we have building, classes in the library building, and another building off-site here. Okay? There are students from all around the world. We typically bring in 30 to 40 different countries in each entry, and 70 to 80 different students, students from 70 to 80 different countries on campus at a time. Again, here's our student center. 
and upon the completion of the program, students have both their MSCS degree, an academic degree, an advanced degree, valuable experience with the American Technology Company, and have increased their intelligence. They've, they've structured a new way of thinking, a new way of feeling, a new way of being through this program and its techniques. So thank you for your attention. Uh, more information is always available on our website and from any of the admissions people and also uh, on our website. Thank you.